bit of a, I guess, a treat or something a little different this morning. How many of you have ever been chalked before? <laughs> we were chalked last night. Cindy left uh, to go to school and she called me on the phone. She said, you have to go outside and look at the driveway. Some of your students from Hillcrest chalked us. And I took some pictures and one day I'll show you. It's just all over the driveway and love music, happy music and Mr. Durden things, good things about Mr. Durden. But it even said good things about Mrs. Durden. And so I said, Cindy, I don't know if they know you from Highland or if they called her a, a kindergarten teacher and Mrs. Durden, Mr. Durden and just happy and music and just all over our driveway. And it was a joy to be chalked. I, I may have even been chalked in a good way before. I mean, have you been chalked in a bad way before? <laughs> All right. This was a, it was a, just a great experience. I mean, I came in. Oh, and there was one little place over there that said, please take pictures and show everybody on Monday. <laughs> and then one of the girls said, he said, you know, uh, uh, Hannah F. And I said, oh, yes, I believe I do. She's one of the students. So she put her name on there. And another one put, I'm in Miss Croft's class. So... Anyway, I got out there this morning. It's kind of cold. I was tapping some pictures, and the sun was in my eye. Not sure what kind I got, but I'm going to take some good pictures of it tomorrow. I will begin to show it to the students. It, it was just fun to, to feel like I've been chalked, <laughs> but in a really good, positive, sweet way. So I have an opportunity tomorrow to share with those students and tell them how much uh, that really meant to me. It was really a big blessing. Power lines are still on. We're still on power lines. Uh, can anybody call out a power line without looking at the wall? <laughs> While you're thinking about your power lines without looking at the wall, remember power lines are just those really quick statements or scriptures in the Bible that we can look at and we can see and uh, remember very quickly. We can get up on Monday morning and think, boy, this is a power line that we've either talked about or I'm going through life and this is a power line that I need to use and apply to my life right now. This is a power line. Something that Jesus said. Something in the Bible that I can relate to. I don't think I have to think about the big, thick Bible. I don't know all of it, but this power line comes to me and says, hey, I can get through this day because of this power line. I may remember the power lines. Alright, who's got one without looking? Seek first. Give me another one. Let your light shine. Let your light shine. That was last week. Great. Awesome. Love your enemy. Love your enemy. It's my man Coy's back there. You know I told him that last week. Did you hear that? Yeah. yeah. yeah he said that. I was yeah, so excited about that. He, he listens. He pays attention. And uh, appreciated him saying that. All right. Anybody else? Uh, we've covered most of them. Through Christ. I can do this. The scripture says I can do all things. I can do this through Christ. Remember Paul in prison was saying, look, whatever I'm going through right now, I can do this. I can get through because of Christ, through Christ. Today is going to be commit to the Lord. Now for a, a quite a long time, I had problems with my pool. The house we moved into that we've been in now 10 years, really I've kind of struggled for quite a while over the years trying to get it cleared up, and trying to get things taken care of and the water wouldn't clean up, had stains, and chemicals weren't uh, always doing their job. And I tried many things to remedy the problem, and finally someone told me to change the sand in the filter. They said sand is only good for about seven years, and then the corners of the sand wear off, and they become ineffective. They don't trap the uh, article of the stuff coming in, and so it doesn't do you any good. Now, how many of you knew that? That's some trivia. You ever hear that question? Sand is a big deal. And a sand filter, if it ever gets real smooth, won't do any good. So I decided this needed to be done. And you know me, I'm kind of a handyman. I try to get everything done around my house first until I break it worse and I have to call somebody. So little did I know what was entailed when I got into this project. But now what I did know was that once the project was started, it had to be finished. I had to commit to it to see it through and very quickly. Because when a pool pump and filter shut down in the summer, it only takes a while for the algae to build up. I mean, no time at all. Even though I was having some problems with chemical and cloudy, I didn't necessarily have an algae problem. But if you let that pump shut down for very long in the summer, you'll have a lot of algae. So the first thing was I had to commit to that project. The next thing was I had to have a plan. See, I was working on a time frame, and just being committed wasn't enough. I could have said this. I could have said, I am committed to changing out the sand in my filter. I could have said that. 
I could have said that uh, I am wholeheartedly committed to changing this out. I could have said I am 100% committed, but I have no real plan to fulfill this commitment. I could have said I'm committed, and I know that I'm committed, that God will take care of this problem because I am committed. I could have said that. And I could think about a plan. I could pray about a plan. I could consider a plan. Uh, I consider starting the project, but God is going to get this done for me. I could have gone at it that way. And you might think about things in life that you have said. I'm very committed to this. And I know God's going to get me through, but there's no plan. <coughs> Commitment, God, no plan. You know as well as I do, the project that I was talking about, no matter how committed I was to it, wasn't going to happen without a plan and follow through on my commitment, right? I could sit in my house and my recliner all day and say, I am so committed to getting that taken care of. So, now that I was committed and I had my plan in hand, I began the project. And the plan included going online to get the instructions, purchasing the sand, borrowing a wet vac. I should have bought one because I, I did ruin this filter. I had to buy a filter. Vacuuming out the sand, putting the sand back in, putting in the water, being careful not to hurt the pipes at the bottom of the filter, and restarting the pump. It was a great plan. But how many of you have had great plans before? Flaws of that plan for me included, I started the project on Friday evening, thinking, boy, i got to get through Friday evening, and as soon as Saturday comes, i got to finish up sometime Saturday so the algae won't come in. And the flaw was, was I started on Friday evening, and my birthday was on that Saturday, and Aaron, our son, called from Houston and said, hey, Mom, Dad, why don't y'all run over here, have lunch for me for Dad's birthday? That's okay, but I'm in the middle of this project. So we took off, ran over, had the lunch. It was awesome. It did really good. And, you know, I came back and I just got right back in the project. So I took that period of time off. I didn't realize what working with sand involved. Have any of you ever worked with sand before? <laughs> Man alive. I didn't have time to let that sand dry because I had to work. The sand would clump in the hose. The sand would clog the filter of the vac. The sand was getting everywhere on me. I felt like a beach. I felt like a sandbox. I felt like a desert. Now that was supposed to be a good line. <laughs> I had sand all over me. I could have I could have been called Mr. Sandman. That wasn't bad either. Wasn't it? I could have even been called Sandy. <laughs> I hate gritty sand. It was an awful experience, but I couldn't stop. I had a plan. I was committed, and I went to work to take care of it. didn't matter how long, how miserable, how sore I got. I had to get the project finished. I did finish the project, and the pools never looked so good, so my problem was the sand all along. Two areas of life, and I think Christians have problems. Commitment and planning. Look at a verse of Scripture. Proverbs 16.3 says this. Commit to the Lord whatever you do and your plans will succeed. Proverbs 16.3. Commit to the Lord whatever you do and your plans will succeed. Now, let's talk about context. Everybody knows I like context, right? How many of you know I like context? I don't like just taking a Scripture and jumping there and here it is a whole bit. Today, though, we're going to talk about context to a certain degree. And I hope you're going to learn something here in this first part. And then I'm going to go to two real quick things about committing plans. But I think there's something we all need to know that I kind of learned and I figured out as I went through and I did my research and my study about Proverbs. How many of you are really familiar with Proverbs? I found some things out. You might want to take note because I, this is some things that were really pretty new to me about Proverbs. Because in many situations, you know, I like to look at context. The context is you have to know what is said before and after a verse of Scripture. The setting, the period of time may have a bearing on the Scripture. But with Proverbs, this is different. Proverbs aren't about a setting, certain people. So knowing what goes on and before doesn't really help to understand Proverbs. So you kind of get the idea. You go to Matthew. It's the storyline pretty much. It's Jesus. It's His, his birth, His time on earth, His walk, and, and His crucifixion. And, and if you read here, you've got to back up a little bit to get into the story and, and figure out you know, what's happening and what's going on. But that's not true for Proverbs. I love this part. Think of it this way. 
Here's where it is. To read straight through a few chapters of Proverbs is like trying to have a conversation with someone who always replies with a one-liner. Now, do you know anyone like that? Know anybody who has a lot of one-liners? When you read through Proverbs, it's like having a conversation with someone who's always putting little one-liners out to you. There was a deacon at First Baptist Newland years ago. Some of you went there, you'll know Ray Ward. Ray Ward and I had, a, had just a great, great guy. Played in our ukulele band and, and sang in the choir. Just a, Ray was just one of those guys. He was just fun to be around. But when Ray and I were together, it was a battle. It was a battle of puns and one-liners back and forth. So we were kind of like the book of Proverbs. In other words, the verses don't go together. They stand on their own. But Ray and I would talk and he would one-line or something. Next thing I know, I'd see something. I'd kind of go back and I'd one-line And we just had this battle back and forth. See, Proverbs are a form of literature that is essentially different from promises. Now, this is something here to hold on to. One of the common mistakes that many Christians make when they read the Proverbs is to take them as promises. Hold on to that thought. Some are promises as well as Proverbs. When the proverb expresses a truth that is always consistent, but it is important to be able to distinguish a proverb from a promise. Hold that thought. Very important. Distinguishing a proverb from a promise. Here's what promises are. Promises are straightforward statements of assurance that guarantee that stated effects will inevitably happen or follow. I say something to you. Um, I promise to you I'm coming to your house at 4 o'clock this afternoon. 401, 402, 403. If I'm not there, what are you going to say? You broke your promise. You said you'd be there at 4 o'clock. You told me something's going to happen and it's supposed to happen at a certain time and you promised it was inevitable for that to happen. That is a promise, but you broke your promise. Proverbs and promises are really different forms of expression and different types of literature. So let me try to clarify the difference between a proverb and a promise. So this is a little bit of an illustration, so kind of hang in here and follow this. The difference between a proverb and a promise. So let's say you were driving along a country road in Arkansas. How many of you know where Arkansas is? Just kidding. We live in Louisiana. It was that state of love up there. If you were driving along the country road in Arkansas, for example, and saw a huge long shed with the word chickens over the doorway, you would probably conclude that there were chickens in that shed. Imagine chickens on the shed. So you get out of your car, you walk over the shed, and you look in, and sure enough, there's hundreds of white, feathery, fucking chickens in there. The time's right. Building chickens inside, chickens coming away everywhere, coming away nuts, you would be exactly right. But say you had a traveling companion with you, and they walked up and they said, they looked in the same building and they said, those aren't chickens, they're pigs. But they wouldn't be right with them. They're chickens. See, that's what happens with Proverbs. Many Christians say when they look in the book labeled Proverbs, they say, those aren't Proverbs, they're promises. No, they're Proverbs. <laughs> Some Proverbs have some promises to them. But they're Proverbs. See, this is the distinction between Proverbs and promises raises the question. If the Proverbs, and all this, are not 100% reliable as statements, and they are Scripture, is Scripture less than 100% reliable? So on that for a second. You read a Proverb, it has some wisdom about life, and maybe you try that wisdom and it doesn't come out exactly the way you think it should have. Does that mean there's something wrong with the Bible? Is the Scripture less than 100% reliable? Absolutely not. Scripture is always reliable. Always. 100% always. But the Proverbs do not claim to be 100% reliable. They're a proverb. They only claim to be a safeguard to what usually happens. That's what a proverb is. If you do this in life, this is the wise thing to do. If you do it, most likely this is going to be the result. 
It doesn't say. There's no guarantee that says if you follow a proverb as a promise, everything's going to happen exactly like it says it's going to happen. And some people say, well, if that's true, then it's not reliable, and so God's Word's not reliable. No, that's not true. God's Word always reliable. A proverb is wisdom. And it's saying, basically, look, in life, this, this, and this, if you follow this, then most likely this is going to happen. See, the proverbs are not commands. He asked this question. Are we disobeying Scripture and sinning, and we do not follow a proverb? For example, example, some proverbs, proverbs say, do not countersign a loan with a stranger. If, if we do that, are we sinning? sinning. Now, some, some of you, some of you may be sitting there thinking, oh, let me think, think about, about some of these. these. Some, some proverbs, proverbs say, do not countersign a loan with a stranger. stranger. If, if we, we do, do that, that, are we sinning? sinning? Let me go back to what, what I just said. No, the proverbs are not commands. They are they revelations of what we usually follow if we do certain things. things. We may, we may choose, choose to countersign with a stranger, stranger under, under certain, certain circumstances, circumstances, but the, the Proverbs warn us about, about what can, can normally expect to happen, happen in most cases if we do. Another well, example is going, going into, into debt. debt. It is it not a sin to go into debt. debt. It is unwise in most cases. cases. You would you probably agree. Is it the wisest thing to do? No, probably not. And that's why the Scripture says, look, it's unwise to do that. We've all, We've all been in debt at some point in time. time. Are we sinning? The proverb is saying to you, the wisdom of a person is, is the, the best, best thing to do is not go into debt. Let me illustrate this way. I like to think of this. I like to do a hot stove. stove. You tell your child, do not put your hand on the stove because it will burn you. Now, is that 100% true? Well, it depends. The truth, the truth is, is, it may or may, may not burn. burn. If the child puts his hand on the stove when it's not on, on he'll be confused. Mom, Mom and Dad, Dad said, don't, don't put my hand on the stove, it will burn, burn me. me. <laughs> Stove's not on. I didn't get burned. Burn. Truth is, he comes back later, the stove is on. Mom and Dad were right. It did burn me. So the so proverb would say, hey, like a parent would say, the wise thing, thing to do is never, ever, ever touch a stove. stove. Why? Why? It could burn. <laughs> may or may not. not. As long as it's all not. You know what? Best, Best not, not to take that, that chance to do that. Correct? Correct. So, so the proverb the words of wisdom from God that God follow, 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 follow will most likely, likely keep, keep you out of trouble. But you may not follow them and everything work out okay. Stove may not be Okay, so maybe on will burn. burn. So the book, the book of Proverbs is about God's God wisdom. wisdom. How to how get it and how to use it. it. It's about, about priorities and principles. Not, not get, get rich quick, quick schemes, schemes and success formulas as the name and claim and theology would have you believe. believe. It, tells it tells you not how, how to make a living, but how to be skillful in the lost part of making a lot. That's, That's so profound. profound. How can you hear you? Tell you not how to make it. But how do you feel beautiful in the long part of making a lot of life? With all, all that's that about the Bible, 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 now maybe have a little bit more understanding. Let's look at the admit plan first. There are several definitions of admit. One is the five years to give, give or trust, 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 charge. This one, this one is about, about getting your time back and effort or something. It's about, it's about putting, putting your trust in God. Putting God in charge, in charge which will lead, lead to admitting totally to Him. To him. I am, I am bidding my life to God because I trust that He will be guide and direct me. That's what this commitment here means. So this so commitment, commitment is a trust, trust and, a and a faith, faith. Commitment. commitment. Commitment is not something, something that we can keep up with things here. Commitment is not something that we put on and take off like a suit. suit. I used to, I used wear, used to wear, wear a suit every, every, every Sunday. 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 The church. I used to wear, used to wear a suit or a coat or coat every day to go to church to work. Commitment is not like being that on the morning and not going back and back and taking it off. In a friendship. You wouldn't, you wouldn't say, say to a friend, friend hey, hey, today, today I'm, I'm committed to you as a friend. friend. And then tomorrow, and then tomorrow I say, say, remember that remember commitment that thing? It's all, all, all. <laughs> on. Yeah, 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 not today. Where, 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 hey, hey, look, I want you to kind of still hang around. Friend. friend. 
But yesterday, the new thing's on. Today, the new thing is kind of off. They may go out. Hey, I may see you in. And they may do that. And they may become your friends. It's kind of off. In marriage, you shouldn't and wouldn't take your marriage by the day. Within a week, say, hey, hey. Honey, you know that commitment he made? I didn't think I was crazy. I just dropped off all the commitment. How do you think? I just don't believe it. Now you might you try something like, like that, but why not let them tell them? Real, Real true, true commitment, commitment is an, an on and off the thing. We shouldn't say to God, you know, under certain circumstances, God, this, this one is yours, uh, a little beyond me, I can't handle this one today, so I'm committing my life to you and I trust that you're going to get me through this one here. Oh, hey, God, today, look, everything's kind of ticking along, all right? God, I got this one. All right, mine's okay today. Uh, kind of hang over there, God, a little bit. Keep your thing, and I'll, I'll come back with my commitment thing to you later. But today's not that bad. Things aren't that rough, so I can really, really, really make it. So the first thing is, commitment isn't something you put on and take off like a suit. Number two, real commitment is not a Sunday thing. It's seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. No vacations and no off days. See, when it says in Proverbs, commit to the Lord whatever you do, that's exactly what it means. Let me give you an illustration here of trust commitment. When I left First Baptist Church of Nederland eight years ago, <clears throat> when I left there, you only had about 18, and since when I came to Crossroads, we were not Baptists, so let me make sure I understand that. We're Baptists now. But we were not a Baptist entity at that point in time. And when I left First Baptist Church of Nederland and Crossroads was not Baptist, was not Baptist. I, only I only had 18, 18 months, months before I had before to do, I had to do something, something with my retirement, retirement fund. fund. Kind of got kind close, of got to, close that to that 18, 18 month, month period, period of time. time. My son, son Aaron, Aaron was, was entering, entering into, into being, being a financial, financial planner. planner. So I so approached, I approached him. him. I said, Aaron. Aaron I've got to move, move my money, my money out, out of this fund over here, here, the annuity board, board somewhere. somewhere. You're, You're becoming a financial, financial planner. planner. So, so I want, I want to, move to move my money to you and, you and give it to you, it to you as a financial, financial planner. planner. And I'll be, I'll honest, be honest, that was that a very was a difficult, difficult decision. decision. Because but money and family, family probably, probably should not be because the outcome could be probably not real good. We'd all agree. So there was a real trust fact regarding committing my retirement in the hands of my son. But I threatened. And I said, Aaron, do a good, do a good job, job with my retirement money, 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 I will move in with you when I'm old. When I'm old. <laughs> if you lose it, I have nothing. I, have nothing. I will have I'll no have place, place to, go. to go. Set me up Set a paper. Boy's done pretty well with it, I think, so far. The thread, I think, has kind of hung in there with it. And he's done it. That kind of trust, that kind of commitment was hard for me. It was a matter of losing control. I can make decisions regarding my retirement, but the financial success of it isn't in my hands right now. The success is in my son's hands. I committed to him, and I trust him. See, I couldn't commit my retirement money to Aaron one day, call him back the next day and say, hey, hey, want it back. <laughs> and take it for a couple more days. Hey, is that what is over here? Hey, I'm not really happy with it. I'm going to bring it back to you for a couple of days. But hey, hey, look, and you know you if know I would have done, done that, I would have had penalties. penalties. I would have had, had problems. Problems. Many, penalties many penalties and problems with her in that, her in that scenario. scenario. Do you know what? You know what? Many, problems many problems and penalties, and penalties in our life occur because, because people are always people taking, taking their commitment back. God. 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 So when it when says, says commit to the Lord, whatever you do, I have to give it all to God and trust Him. Whatever I do, that's very specific, isn't it? Not some, some things, things partially what, what I do, but whatever I do, I'm going, I'm going to, to do something, something that needs to be to God. God. Psalm, Psalm 37, 5 says, says commit your way to the Lord, trust, trust in Him, and He will, and he will do, do this. this. Let's look, Let's look at plans, plans real quick. Your plans, your plans will, will succeed. succeed. That's, that's, that's the second part, part of that verse of Scripture. Of scripture. Some, years some years ago, the great, the great thinker, and it probably brings to mind who that is, the great Think thinker is, is so think on, who is the great, great thinker for a moment. But some, some years, years ago, ago, the great, the great thinker, thinker was on a train, train and bound, bound to New York, York City. City. And as the ticket taker came through to take the ticket, ticket the great, great thinker, I, 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 I said, son, I don't have my ticket with me. 
In the guys, guys said, look at all the restaurants. We know who you are. We, we trust, trust you. you. Don't, Don't worry, worry about, about the ticket. ticket. I, I know you bought a ticket, and it's, and it's okay. okay. And, he goes, and he goes on his way. Guy, guy comes, comes back, back to the train, and there's Mr. Ryan's right great thinker. And I mean, mean he goes through his pocket, he's looking on the floor, he's doing everything that he possibly can to find that ticket mail man. He said, look, I'm not worried about the ticket. I know you. I trust you. Quit looking for the ticket. And Mr. Pine Sandstein said to his son, this isn't a matter of trust, but a direction. I need to find a ticket because I forgot where I'm going. Do you have a clear sense of where you want to go in life and plan? <coughs> are you headed toward their de destination, moving away from that destination, or are you simply <coughs> standing idle? The first foundational secret for wise living is simply this. Wise people have a sense of their God-given destination and have made plans of going there. Wise people know where they want to go in life and have a plan for getting there. You notice the scripture doesn't say, Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and you will succeed. That's not what it says. Now, you may not have noticed, but that's not what it says. It doesn't say, commit to the Lord whatever you do, and you will succeed. Does it say that? Why? I'm leaving something out. Huh? It says, commit to the Lord whatever you do, and your plans will succeed. Cindy and I got here on our first, our first vacation. vacation. She, she noticed. noticed. I planned, I planned the, whole the whole vacation out. How many of you like that? Like Any of y'all plan, plan your vacation? Or you go on a trip? Or you do something? I mean, dun, 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 dun. Got it all planned out. After a couple of first vacations, what I would do, I, mean, I, I was the man of the house. I thought that was my responsibility. We're going to be gone for a week. We leave at this time. We're going to probably stop here and get some gas. We're going to go down here. We're going to stop here for a day or two while we're here. We're going to see this. We're going to go here. We're going to take care of this. And I had it all pretty much planned out. I mean, every vacation. After a couple of years, and he walked up to me. We're on vacation. And I had my little itinerary plane. And she took it from me. And she went, she went, and threw it into the wind. And I interpreted that. And I now, and I now know, know what that, that means on vacation. On vacation. <laughs> a book, a book water, water, sun, sun and, rest. and rest. And no itinerary. She doesn't she want it. She says, I don't want an itinerary. I don't want a plan on vacation. When I go on vacation, give her a book, 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 be, she, 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 she likes to be, you know, somewhere where she can kind of lay out in the sun, sun and, get and get rid of it. That is, that is, is it. It's not it's to say that she doesn't, she doesn't want to go see things or do things, things, but she wants, she wants to be very spontaneous. There's no plan, no, 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 no idea. And I like, I like it. I can enjoy it. I can go on a vacation and not necessarily have that type of plan. And when she's doing her stuff, sometimes I'm kind of walking around like, okay, I'm going to do that. I have to find me something to do. But hey, that's okay. That's what she likes to do. And that's okay. But many but people, people live their, their life, life totally, totally without, without plans. plans. Like those, like vacations. those vacations. There's, no, There's plan no plan to study to God's, God's word. word. There's no plan no to plan attend to church regularly. regularly. No plan, no plan to plan witness. To witness. Plan, plan to minister. I don't have one of those. A prayer plan. plan. I thought about, I thought about praying, praying one time. time. No plan, no plan to increase, increase their walk, their walk, walk with the Lord. Walk with the Lord. You mean, am I supposed to have a walk with the Lord? Just, Just spontaneous, spontaneous Christian living, living. not drawing the Lord, Lord. No, plan, no plan, no action. No action. Maybe even you were committed. committed. Okay. Okay. What are you committed, what are you committed to, do? to do? I don't know. I don't know. Nothing. Is my pool, pool going to get done without the plant? No. But you, you as a Christian, you say, you know what? I might would even like to grow as a Christian. Have a plan? Mm -hmm. No. Well, don't really have a plan. The greatest plan in the Bible that I've come across is Solomon. Once Solomon's empire was tranquil or got uh, all going, he began to build the holy temple. And, and he built quite a few things. Solomon was known as a builder. He was renowned for his building projects. If you look at Solomon, you'll discover that the wise king worked from a well-developed plan. And listen very carefully. He gathered the necessary resources. He organized the people. I mean thousands and thousands and thousands of people. He designed the facility. He set a time to begin his project. He completed the project um, and he finished it up. There was a plan. Solomon, if you will follow Solomon in the Bible, one of the greatest planners, buildings built the whole time under Solomon. He had plans. Solomon clearly understood the importance of 
Not just a commitment, but a plan. Remember what I said earlier? You can commit all day, but if you don't plan and execute, all you will end up with is a commitment. Proverbs 21.5 says, Good planning and hard work lead to prosperity, but hasty shortcuts lead to poverty. Words of wisdom, right? No promise in there. Just God's Word saying, Good planning and hard work lead to prosperity, but hasty shortcuts lead to poverty. Compliment Erskine. Erskine. I gave Erskine a uh, I'm going to give him a pat on the back. He committed to rekeying the church. He put a plan in place. He is executing the plan, and we're safer for his work. How many of you know and understand that? You give Erskine a pat on the back. He made a commitment. Came up, came with, up plan. with a plan. He's executing, He's executing the plan. Because of what he did. The writer, the writer probably gave us, gave us great, great wisdom. Get everything, everything to the Lord, and He will, and he will make the plan successful. successful. Let me conclude with this. Proverbs 16, 16 3. This is the power, power line. Commit, commit to the Lord. Lord. You can learn, you can learn that, that part of the power line. Commit, commit to the Lord. Lord. Why, why whatever, whatever you, you do, and your, and your plans, plans will succeed. succeed. That really is the power line, isn't it? I say Proverbs 16, 3 is a proverb and a promise. Why is that? The problem, the problem is, is commit, commit to the Lord whatever you do. You think that's, you think that's wise? wise? I mean, you think that's wise. Come on, come on. I mean, you maybe think you're wise to commit to the Lord. At three, at three, at four, at five, let's keep going. How many, How many think, think? Come on, come on. Really, really seriously. seriously. <coughs> it's, it's wise and wise, wise to commit to the Lord. It is, isn't it? That's wisdom. Wow, Proverbs. Yes. That's wise to do. That is the wise thing to do in life. Try life on your own without the Lord. Commit to the Lord, Lord, Lord and you will be the beneficiary of a promise. What is a promise? Your plans will succeed. I promise to me. Commit to, to the Lord. Lord Proverbs. Proverbs. What's going to happen? Plan, plan, plan to succeed. Try to really quickly wrap up a little illustration here. Crossroads Fellowship, I think, and you would agree, has a tremendous opportunity. We have a part of our building over here screaming to be used, don't we? How many any of y'all hear it? It's just, come on, listen. Any of y'all hear it? It's screaming. I mean, it's just coming out really loud. Please use me. I'm over here. Come over here. Y'all hear it? Yeah, I'm over here. I'm ready. It's there. It's big. We can commit to moving forward and using that part of the building, and if we only commit, which is very important, several years from now, that part of the building will look the same, correct? We're going into the future. We're going to be talking and we're going to be praying about commitment. And the planning has already begun. The building team has met twice. The building team isn't the end-all, the end-all. They're a planning entity with the goal of this being a church project. So I'm going to give you the plan that is already being implemented. Commit, commit to the project, the, project, the building, building team meeting, meeting on a regular, on a regular basis, basis, troubleshooting, troubleshooting all, the all the challenges that lie before us, design, design drawings on the layout, drawing layout, layout, address AC, AC power, power issues, issues, consider sound design, lighting staging, staging decorative, decorative considerations, additional construction of storage, a cost analysis, a financial strategy set a time, recruit the congregation, delegate the work, and see the project through. Do you think that's a good plan? I ran through it, but it's a plan. Kind of sounds familiar. How about Solomon's plan for the temple? I'm pretty sure when Solomon announced his plans, he had some naysayers. You think he did? You mean you're going to do what with that building, that temple? Man, they go all through all the stuff of what really happened and what they got, what they gathered, and how long it took. I mean, study the temple being built, and he would, he would, he could imagine that. That's, that's, that's not, not going to happen. happen. It ain't going to happen. We do the, we same, do the same thing. thing. Moving, Moving over to the other building, building is it going to happen? Or are we playing? playing? Proverbs, Proverbs 16. Commit to, to the Lord, Lord whatever, whatever you, do. you do. And your plans, plans will, will succeed. succeed. One of the things I'm looking to see in my notes that I didn't put on there that I'm really planning to do because it's just part of the plan. Pray. 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 Even considering a 40 days of prayer time. Just say the congregation has 40 days. Send it up. Start at this point in time, 40 days. Go for it. Go for it. Go for it. We want to follow you. So we have a plan. Proverb 16.3. I'm going to claim it. 
Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and your plans will succeed. Who will follow and do that? Verses. Father, we come before you today. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you that we've been able to come together to sing and praise you and worship you. Thank you. Thank you for the blessings. Thank you for being the great, mighty, powerful God that you are in our lives. Thank you for being the great, mighty, powerful God that you are in our lives. And God, we God, always we thank you for your word. word. Just, just even knowing and understanding, understanding it more for me, at least it helps, helps me, God, God, to understand, understand now, now understand Proverbs, the wisdom that lies in Proverbs, and sometimes the promises that go along with the wisdom. And now, God, as we enter into our time of invitation, I just pray if there's and anyone that's here that's never made that first that first, that first step, step into salvation, salvation. today could be the day of salvation. And they can say, look, I want to begin my commitment, my walk, my life, and my trust in Jesus Christ. They can come forward today for salvation. God, I pray for Christians who are here say, you know, never truly understood this commitment plan. Maybe need to start with commitment, but definitely have to work on the plan part of it. God, I pray at this point in time that you work in any Christian's life through the Holy Spirit. Move in their heart and life for them to come. And just make this an altar if they want to pray. God, I'll pray with anyone as their pastor. But God, if this is a rededication time, I pray, God, that you just move in their lives. I pray for anyone that's here today that just has some needs in their lives, God, that, that we are here as your people, as your facilitators to help encourage and lift those up that have needs in their hearts and lives. God, we pray for anyone that's here today that just needs you. So God, we turn this time of invitation over to you. It's yours. God, we just want to give you all trust in you and depend upon you and be committed to you and have plans to know what to do as a congregation. We love you for it's your name. I pray. Amen.